So welcome everyone to our October Sacramento Symphony meeting. Um, of course, you know the subject, the TLX project, a successor to Symphony Time Code, um, presented by Peter Symes. And before we get started, I just want to cover a couple of things. One is, um, I just wanted to recognize our Symphony board uh, with our chair, Remington Maxwell, who's here tonight, uh, Dom Jackson, our past chair, Secretary Treasurer's Mona Smothers, she's here tonight, thank you. Uh, manager Sean Case, myself, Patty Leonard, who's here, uh, Gil Mazzi, who's here, Paul Turner, who's here, and Tim Walker. Um, I wanted to let you know that Simpty just recently um, updated the uh, Simpty logo and kind of a new look and new um, direction for Simpty. Uh, there's also an updated website. So if you do go to the Simpty website, simpty.org, you'll see that. Uh, they've also created uh, unique logos for each section. Here's our Sacramento section, the state capitol, a few buildings. Uh, here's the, uh, the landing page for the new website, in case you guys get there and find that. Uh, one thing I found that was extremely helpful is I go to the Simpty website often for Simpty standards. And it used to be a few clicks to get to that. And now it's uh, right up here on the top, digital library. So it's pretty fast to get to the, uh, the standards now. Uh, there's also um, a number of free webinars and webcasts that Simpty is doing. They're pretty easy to find when you get to the website and you maybe have been getting emails on them. I've attended several so far and they've been, been really helpful, really good stuff. So uh, in, in the wake of uh, the pandemic, Simpty is, is uh, working to, uh, you know, educate and get the information out and doing that through a lot of webcasts. Um, also, there's uh, virtual courses, a number of virtual courses, and these uh, cost money. Uh, right now, Simpty's reduced the price by 50%. So it's something else if you're interested in attending one of those courses, you can use the Simpty 50 uh, discount code. Um, also, uh, standards and papers and the, the journal are free until the end of the year, and you can find that also on the website with the free standards and publications link. Um, another notice is that um, Simpty recognizes that some people may be uh, having financial hardships during the pandemic, and uh, they're offering 50% uh, off normal pricing for a membership dues. And if, uh, if you want to inquire on that, you just con contact Roberta Gorman at Simpty, R. Gorman at Simpty. Um, I did want to also list, I don't know if everyone's aware of membership pricing, but there's a couple of new levels now, including uh, recent grad and retired. Um, and there's also the fan level, which is free, which does get you access to certain things. So just something to be aware of with respect to membership pricing. And we uh, always encourage uh, non-members to join Simpty. Be happy to have you as a member. Um, also, uh, since we're uh, in the midst of the pandemic, there's no fall conference this year. Uh, that's uh, in-person fall conference. There will be a virtual version of the fall conference. And uh, that will take place uh, Tuesday through Thursday, November 10th through 12th. And um, there's a, about a, a minute long video that explains how it's gonna work. So if you do go to the website, uh, you'll see that. You can click on, on the, this uh, image and watch the video. I think you can also get to it here. And here's, here's what the uh, uh, virtual conference will look like. It actually looks like a conference center and you enter rooms sort of like you would have if you were there physically. And um, the one really nice thing about being virtual this year is, is that it's a lot less expensive and it's gonna be available to everyone around the world. So you don't have to travel to LA to attend. So I think there's a huge benefit there. So that's something you're interested in that's coming up in uh, just three weeks. Okay, I wanted to um, uh, or introduce Peter. Uh, Peter Symes' his early career included positions in the BBC Studio Planning and Installation Department, Philips Broadcast, and Central Dynamics Limited. From 1983 to 2007, 
He worked at Grass Valley with positions responsible for product planning, strategic planning, and intellectual property management. In 2007, Symes joined the staff of SIMPTI as Director of Standards and Engineering, a position held until retirement in 2016. Today, he is the owner of Symes TV Consulting, offering technical and patent-related services to the industry. Symes holds three patents and is the author of books on video compression. He is a Life Fellow of SIMPTI, a senior member of the IEEE, and a certified standards professional uh, by the standard, sorry, by the Society for Standards Professionals. So, welcome, Peter. We're very happy to have you here tonight and to present on uh, TLX, and I'll let you uh, take it from here. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining. Um, you're dealing with a snapshot of a very long saga. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sempty Time Code and its origins uh, because it's important to understand the where we're coming from and the where we need to go to, uh, and then talk about a new project. Well, not all that new now, but uh, it's getting somewhere, I think. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go along. Uh, first of all, the... Okay, so I've obviously got the wrong thing for controlling because the side didn't change, right? I think, Peter, you just need to click your mouse in your uh, PowerPoint slide window. And then, there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bob. <laughs> all right. So first of all, the disclaimer. This is an ongoing project. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about the standards process, uh, it's probably most effectively uh, compared to sausage making. You may like the end result, but you certainly wouldn't like the process. Uh, and I've got more people in the waiting room, so wait a moment. Uh, we've got Tom Jackson and we've got Michelle. So I think we've now got people back. Can I move that? Uh, I probably can. So anyway, um, normally we don't give out too much detail of the ongoing thing because we don't want people to sort of jump ahead and uh, try and come up with something close to the standard that they then declare to be proprietary and upset everybody. Um, so, uh, but uh, with the permission of the engineering of standards vice president, uh, we can talk about what's going on and that's what's happening today, but it is important to realize anything you hear today is subject to change. Oops. Ah, how do I go back? Ah, that works. All right. So let's go back to the origins. Um, particularly in this day and age where a lot of the people, um, with certain noticeable exceptions on the meeting today, uh, but uh, you know, may not have actually dealt with videotape as videotape. But the original videotape editing was cut and splice, just like people used to do with audio tape. In fact, if you look on the right, you'll see a two-inch splicing block for uh, editing two-inch tape from a quad machine uh, by li lining up where you want to go, running a razor blade from one side to the other to cut at a slight angle along the mag track, uh, and then doing the same with another bit of tape and putting sticky tape over them and hoping the result would go through the heads when you actually came to replay it. Wasn't always the case. Um, electronic editing came along, was introduced in the 60s, and what this meant, to, meant was you had a machine that could switch from playback to record without discontinuity, so you could play back part of a show and, uh, sorry, I'm just admitting somebody else from the waiting room, um, and then switch the machine to record and put in uh, a new segment. Now, realized that that necessarily meant that you what you were recording now was second generation because it was coming presumably from another tape and the early vtr's second generation was pretty bad uh, but people eventually decided okay we got to the stage where second generation is deemed acceptable so it was possible to do electronic editing uh, with a transmittable result uh, I had certain personal experiences uh, concerning this when I worked for the BBC back in the 
uh, late 60s, uh, we had a, a protocol there called grade one broadcasts. And these were things like party political broadcasts and royal family broadcasts where all hell would fly if they were interrupted. And the rule for a grade one broadcast was that no editing was permitted. Uh, and I probably bored some of you with a very long tale about trying to record the Queen's speech one year, uh, but we won't go into that now. But at that stage, they, do, they would not permit uh, an edited recording uh, to be used for a grade one broadcast. Anyway, again, uh, the first thing that really helped automate this process was something from Ampex called Editech, uh, which allowed for you to time this switch from uh, replay to record uh, and program your edit. But it was specifically a single edit and there was no timeline for the program as a whole. A lot of people realized this was not uh, going to be a viable solution for very long. So various companies started introducing time codes to let you address specific parts of a program track. Oops, I'm sorry, there we are. <laughs> well, how important was this? I just found this thing uh, that uh, from papers of Clay T. Whitehead, who uh, from a broadcaster's perspective told us what he thought were the three most important things of 1969. One was random access audio cartridge machines, one was walking on the moon, and one was empty time code. So even at the beginning, some people thought that empty time code was pretty important. The it was 1969 when the SEMPTI videotape uh, committee was told that we needed a standard for time code. Uh, they set up an ad, ad hoc committee of users to draft the requirements. They liaised with the Videotape Production Association, which included a lot of the manufacturers, and reported to the conference in 1970. But in the meantime, a subcommittee was formed to draft the standard. That, of course, had users and manufacturers. And... Uh, Agreement started in 69, it really uh, went on into 1970 uh, to come up with something that they felt met all the requirements of the ad hoc group. And then in 1974, it became an American or draft American national standard and became a national standard. Um, and these were a couple of extracts from the standard itself at that stage. And I'd just like to put you note, if you look over on the right hand side, that the original standard did include the concept of recording time code in the vertical interval, although nobody at that stage come up with a mechanism to do it. So let's just look at anatomy of the time code signal. It was designed as an audio signal with uh, biphase encoding to record on the Q track of a quad BTR. It had a sync signal so that uh, as the uh, tape passed the head, uh, you could find out where to sync up to the signal and decode it, uh, including a direction bit uh, so that, uh, or you know, an asymmetry in the sync signal so that you knew whether you were uh, reading this forwards or backwards, because that's pretty important. And it had BCD data uh, for each of the uh, numeric characters in the time code. That was uh, provided to minimize the cost of the display. Um, over on the right hand side, I've uh, put a picture of a Nixie tube, which was the way people displayed this sort of thing in those days. And BCD was very friendly to Nixie tubes, basically just needed one driver chip and bang, you were done. Uh, so, and in those days, of course, computation was expensive, particularly what classified this classified then as reasonably fast computation or uh, processing. Uh, so minimizing the processing to get from the signal to the display was really important. I mentioned that because we've had a lot of discussions uh, about what sort of format should be used and what matters and what doesn't uh, in, in today's standards work. So it was an hours, hours, minutes, minutes, seconds, seconds, frame, frames format. A, the design was harmonized with the EBU standard for 25 uh, frame per second time code. But of course, in, in the NTSC world, uh, we had to cope, cope with the fact that 
NTSC by that stage, when color had come along, uh, was no longer 30 hertz. It was 29.97 frames per second, roughly, um, which really screwed things up. Uh, It screwed things up in the sense that if you just let the uh, count go, assuming uh, 30 frames per second, uh, by the end of an hour, you were 3.6 seconds off. And as one of my commercial broadcaster uh, friends expressed it, a 3.2nd overrun is a disaster, a 3.6 second underrun is a marketing opportunity. Uh, But so something had to be done and because part of the problem, and you say it's both a benefit and the problem, is this looks like a time display, right? It shows, you know, eight hours, 16 minutes, 23 seconds, and some number of frames which move really fast. The trouble is, because then that means people want to use it as a time display, and that really is not much use if it goes wrong by 3.6 seconds an hour. So they introduced this drop frame mode where once per minute for the first nine minutes of each 10, you dropped two counts. You went from uh, uh, 28 to 00, zero, uh, sorry, 27 to 00, zero, uh, instead of uh, 28, uh, 29 to 00. Zero. You did that once per minute for nine minutes uh, and then uh, didn't do anything on the 10th minute and that managed to correct you the average of 1.8 frames per second uh, to make the uh, times, the displayed time look like real time. Still only approximate, it would be marginally off and it was very slightly off over the period of a day so people would do jam sync once a day to line it up again. Time code also include user bits, uh, not specified how they were used. Again, it provided eight uh, BCD uh, nibbles uh, for user bits, uh, they were optional, and there is one RP that defines one way you could use them, but they never came into uh, any generalized, standardized uh, method of, of use. Uh, on the t- these are just some of the enhancements that have happened to SC12 along the way, uh, including, I put at the top, RP179, which was a page line coding Uh, so that you could uh, put structured information into the user bits. Uh, Again, not very widely adopted and certainly not, um, you know, uh, anything like the importance of the base standard itself. But the standard was tweaked and pushed around and twisted and all sorts of things done to it uh, until what we consider to be the final reservation excuse me, modifications to the basic standard in 2014. And then we came along 2016 and added a limited high, uh, high frame rate uh, option to it. But it's basically at the stage now where if you tried to change it again or enhance it again, the whole thing would really fall to bits and you probably couldn't maintain any backward compatibility, which says we need to be looked for a successor. And that doesn't mean anything's immediately going to come in, replace time code. Um, But uh, and even assuming that a replacement gets widespread uh, market acceptance, there's going to be a long changeover period with ST12, you know, being in use in a lot of facilities for a long time to come. And that's part of what we have to consider uh, when designing a new system. But in 2007, uh, I talked with Hans Hoffman and we, we, I can't remember which way it started off, but one of the bits of the conversation was, isn't it silly that in this increasingly digital age to synchronize uh, equipment in a studio, we're distributing color black, which is quite a difficult signal to handle because uh, it requires pretty good equalization, uh, lots of DAs, lots of coax. And you know what, it's a 1970s standard. And in a digital world, couldn't we do better than that? And then it went on to, well, yeah. And the other uh, notable 1970s standard, of course, is empty time code. And maybe we need to do something about that as well. Now, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. But why regard one of the major 
events uh, in that period was a meeting that uh, uh, at uh, Ampas in 2008 with a table full of Hollywood Post professionals uh, where we talked about what do we want as something to replace time code and they came up with the concept of a digital birth certificate which said we want to label each frame or media unit if we uh, want to be a bit more general with a precision timestamp an ID for the source it came from and then a counter because however sophisticated you get with time it's really good idea to have a count of how many frames have gone by. Now <laughs> that was 12 years ago uh, and that concept I believe still to be uh, absolutely critical and it's a part of the TLX project although an awful lot of stuff has gone off in different directions since then. So subsequent to the task force report from the SEMT EBU, uh, work started on a new time labeling system and we ended up with two competitors, uh, both I would characterize as trying to boil the ocean. Uh, probably either one would have provided an acceptable solution, but there was a good deal of rivalry and an inability to compromise and neither of them could get uh, enough uh, momentum, if you like, to say, okay, this is going to be the direction going forward. In the meantime, we were working on synchronization, and I mentioned this for a very specific reason here. Uh, traditionally for synchronization, we produced a clock, and if we're interested in more than one standard or more than one frequency, we usually try and get a clock that's related to the lowest common multiple of the frequencies we're dealing with. Well, that's tricky as I'll show on the next uh, slide. And even more so if you come up with requirements like we really want to be able to do any standard, even if we don't know what it is yet. Carrying back onto time code for a moment, the uh, Howard Luck put together a bunch of uh, uh, time code summits in 2016, which were really helpful in dragging out what people wanted and we got this list of principal list of requirements that we should be able to support multiple rates, including integer and non-integer rates, support of very high and very low rates, support of variable rate acquisition, if someone's hand cranking a camera, for example, uh, the time span should not be limited to 24 hours. And we need to be able to define, not just translation algorithms, but to be able to define working practices for a mix of SC12 and the replacement labeling, because we know that's going to happen. If somebody does go in the new direction, there's still going to be SC12 stuff appear and vice versa. So these were the principal requirements that came out of that set of uh, uh, summits that Howard put together. It's going back to this magic number thing, because it's quite important. Uh, as I say, what one idea, one traditional way of doing things was choose the least common multiplier and then we could count down to all the frequencies we actually needed. And that's okay as long as you have a relatively small number of integer rates, but it gets really, really complicated when you start dividing by 1.001, uh, end up with, you know, essentially not useful numbers if we try to want to uh, have direct counts for all of the standards we might want to use. And that same really applies if we want to be able to label arbitrary frame rates and possibly including variable frame rates. How do we provide usable arithmetic if we're just, if we've got some, you know, time code as we put it, some code that we create for each frame uh, that's derived from the frame rate uh, like time code, the original time code is. You, you basically can't do it. So the idea in both of these contexts is to use precision time values instead. So for synchronization, uh, we provide, and the 702059 standard uh, provides a regular signal of a high precision time value to everybody on the network. Each receiving device that wants to synchronize has a local oscillator counted down to also come up with a time value and uh, those would be compared with the incoming tribe uh, uh, time values from the server 
and you adjust the local oscillator until they're in sync and stay in sync. Uh, for labeling, fairly simple, we just say, okay, if we have a source of precision time, we just use that time to label each frame or media unit or audio frame or whatever it is we're trying to label. And chosen for synchronization was the IEEE 1588 precision time protocol. It distributes uh, a seconds and nanoseconds signal, 48 bits of seconds, 32 bits and nanoseconds, provides a one nanosecond resolution. That's not necessarily one nanosecond accuracy, by the way, but provides a one nanosecond resolution. And this has been chosen not only for the ST2059 synchronization, uh, but also by all the guys working on video or over IP in the 2110 families. And it's also proposed as the uh, time value stamp that we would use within TLX, which stands for time label extensible. And this is why. We started off with this concept from 2008 of the digital birth certificate. because We went back to a lot of these people and said, hey, it's a long time since you came up with this. Is it still the right answer? And pretty well, the answer was, yep. If you can give us that, uh, that basically gives us, as we call it, a birth certificate, uh, a, a unique identifier uh, for each frame, and we can do whatever we want then. So the whole concept of TLX was to say, to try and avoid the boil the ocean concept and uh, keep building things, let's come up with a label which includes the elements of the digital birth certificate, but at the same time, let's define within the standard a mechanism for adding other label item types to the label. Uh, so that you could just come back with a simple document and saying, I want to identify a new item within a, that might be in a TLX label. Uh, here's its specification. Uh, we don't need go back and change the original standard. Uh, we just use this as an addendum and we've done it and avoid substantive revision to the standard or we're still starting over because uh, we didn't have everything we need. So, Initially, we started off by saying, all right, let's look at these digital birth certificate items. That's easy, right? Yeah, right. Uh, the extensibility mechanism, and that's actually probably turning out to be the least of the issues, really, uh, will define TLX items, one of for each data value. For example, there would be a TLX item for the timestamp, uh, sometimes with associated metadata. Uh, profiles, which I'll come to in a moment, and then the structures, how do we put the whole thing together? Still very fluid because as you'll see in a minute, we've actually done some backtracking and there's still a lot of quite fundamental discussion going on, although I do believe we've actually moved into substantive process in the last few months, substantive progress. But basically we're saying a TLX label is a collection of one or more TLX items. A TLX item is fundamentally one item of information with its necessary metadata, uh, maybe more than one representation. For example, you could have a unique source ID such as the equipment's MAC address, uh, or people might want to use it or to have an alternative item, not decided this one yet, where they can just put things in like camera one, camera three, uh, you know, uh, first base camera, whatever, uh, based upon production values. The TLX profile, uh, really not being discussed in very great detail at the moment, but it's, it's something we've got there as a, when we've got our act together on the items and the label, let's revisit this and decide uh, how it should be implemented. The idea that this is very much application oriented. And it may say if uh, you're creating a profile, you say, if you deliver video to me, I want the TLX labels to have a PQR uh, profile, which means it must include 
certain TLX items. It may include others. It may have a com constrained size for the complete label. It could even have multi-part rules like uh, item A is mandatory, B, C, B, C, and D are optional, but if pre is, B is present, C must also be present, and the maximum label size of 256 bytes. That's just you know, pulled out to come up with a silly example. But the idea is that you know, if there's an identified need uh, that uh, you know, uh, a significant number of people have a need for, uh, we could define uh, profiles with any of these structures. And then we started out using KLV type local sets to sort of say, okay, how do we put this thing together as a binary signal? Well, we could get there and we may very well return to this when dealing with a binary signal, but uh, then had some very good input that said, well, look, there will be a need for a binary format, but many applications are going to need to interface with databases. And a binary coded signal is a pretty lousy way to start off interfa interfacing with a database. And if we only provide one representation and people come up with their own translations to different representations, we're very quickly going to have a host of incompatible uh, or sometimes apparently compatible, but with some subtle difference that makes them not work properly. Uh, we decided in the end we'd provide several representations of each defined item and really rigorously evaluate these to say, within the rules, any of item of one format can be converted to the same item of any other format and back again with zero loss. And we currently the list is uh, binary. We will need a binary signal without a doubt. Uh, XML and JSON as being uh, very suitable for interfacing with databases. The given the way things are going at the world at the moment, JSON is clearly a requirement. You could argue that if you have JSON, you don't need XML, uh, but there's an awful lot of SEMPTI work being done in XML, uh, an awful lot of things where TLX will have to be incorporated into XML structures. So again, rather than having people create their own transcoding from JSON to XML, we decided we will define the binary, we will define the XML, and we'll define the JSON for each item that's permitted to be in a TLX label. Finally, we seriously considering adding a fourth uh, item to the uh, initial uh, list. Uh, pretty well anything you can do with ST12, you can do with a combination of the timestamp and the media count. But that doesn't necessarily deal with every subtlety of what might be in an ST12, uh, what the phasing of the drop frame is, uh, whether people have used user bits and this sort of thing. So we think it's probably a good idea to aid in the transition uh, to have an optional item, which is literally a coded SD12 signal. And people can use that during the transitional period if they find it helpful, uh, or they can set their workflows as it's not necessary, uh, or they can use it forever, we don't care. But what you can do is you can take ST12, which the standard defines as a binary sequence, and put it in uh, what we did here was uh, John uh, Fletcher from BBC put this together. Here's part of a, uh, a, um, a JSON representation uh, of a part of a ST12 instance where, you know, we just have uh, specified things for hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. There are rules that the uh, you know minutes can't go above fifty nine and so on, uh, so that if you have something that conforms to the restrictions put forth in the ST twelve standard, it can be put into this JSON representation and similarly into with an XML schema into an XML document, uh, and either of those could be transposed between them 
or back into the original ST12 binary and it would be the same as you put in. They said, maybe making heavy weather of that, but protecting the ST12 environment as we move forward, we think is absolutely key uh, to uh, acceptance. Now, time representation. Well, having said what I did, it's pretty obvious, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know how many months we've discussed this and how many times we've been around the loop. Um, I think we are closing in on a decision. Uh, one of the differences from today and 1969 is processing today is cheap. We don't need to design the data signal so that it's optimized for a particular display mechanism. And in fact, you know, almost all of the displays will be indirect, probably end up in some computer somewhere before they appear in some form of human readable display. Uh, people argued that using things like BCD was more human readable. Well, a binary sequence is not human readable. You have to translate it into some display mechanism and whereas in 1969 it was critical to do that with a single component if you could um, today translating 1588 to any other time display is going to be widespread hardware is going to be available there may even be fpga calls already i don't know but i'm sure they will be there so you know reading a uh, IEEE 1588 signal into whatever format you want to use for processing or put on a user display or whatever is going to be a tiny fraction of a pretty cheap FPGA and really isn't very relevant. The PTP provides adequate precision for frame rates up to at least a mega frame per second. Um, as I mentioned before, PTP has been adopted for SEMTI 2059 and 2110 families. And we think as we look at the families of forward moving SEMTI standards, if we can avoid conversions uh, as we go between these standards, all the better. And as I said, PTP can be uh, easily converted to any required display format. That's not to say that at some point somebody might want an alternative time representation and we'll have to see if that happens. But at the moment, the proposal is to use the uh, PTP 48 bit seconds, 32 bits, the nanoseconds, uh, and label the frames like that. But it doesn't stop there. What time are we going to convey? There are lots of them. <laughs> and most of the conversions and offsets are pretty easy. Uh, the one that's uh, fairly tricky to deal with uh, because uh, TAI includes it, UTC does not, is leap seconds. Now for anyone who's not familiar with this, let me briefly tell you what a leap second is. <clears throat> Excuse me, none of my friends at Semti would believe me if I said that was water, but it really is. Uh, the earth rotates approximately once every 24 hours and but because of moving oceans and magma and everything like that there is a loss of angular momentum so the earth is slowing down not very rapidly but it is slowing down and the physicists who control uh, TAI uh, when they defined it, said, well, all right, we've already had 10 leap seconds. Um, every so often, when the error becomes of TAI versus rotational time, if you like, so uh, becomes uh, over half a second, we will, or heading up to half a second, we will predict that on such and such a date, typically about six months in the future, we're going to drop a second. Okay, to compensate for the Earth slowing down. Up to date, there have been a total of 37 leap seconds. I think that's dating back to 1959, something like that. Um, and yeah, you can deal with any one of these formats. Uh, most 
people use UTC, that may be the best way to go. But if you're conveying a time, you certainly need to know whether or not it's got leap seconds built into it or not. If you're looking for uh, possible forensic use, I'm just admitting Adrian, who's waiting out there, has spotted him waiting. Um, you do have to decide either what which standard of time you are going to use or what metadata will be used to tell the user what will be used to allow he or she to do a conversion if that's what's necessary. Sounds pedantic, but we're also looking at the fact that, you know, ST12 got used in a host of environments outside broadcast television for which it was originally intended, uh, all sorts of scientific things, theaters, you name it, uh, use empty time code as a driving mechanism. And we would hope to make TLX available again to multiple communities. And we want to make it as rigorous as possible so that the, you know, the scientists of the world don't have to say, oh, those dumb empty guys never thought about what real time is about. And it's, it's a difficult science, believe me. Uh, one of the things we've had to fight in the standardized process is one very brilliant guy who's a member of the group uh, would really like, have liked us to go back and redefine the science of time starting from scratch. And there was pretty good unanimity against him, but uh, it took a little bit of time to persuade him that, no, we're not going to do that. Oops. So we talked about TLX item. Uh, so we'll look at some of the ones we think could happen. Uh, we expect there to be a timestamp. We expect there to be a source ID and we expect them to be, there to be a count. And this could be uh, an arbitrary starting count or it could be a count that uh, started at, uh, you know, zero when you started shooting or you know, you could do a thing a bit like uh, many people do with time code and say, let's start the media count at 3,600, equivalent to an hour. Uh, people could do what they want there, but the idea is irrespective of possible variable frame rates, this just counts one per frame or one per media unit. So if you think about it, if you do have variable frame rates, somebody hand cranking a camera, the combination of the media count and the timestamp allows you to see exactly what happens and process accordingly. Other things we might put in TLX items, I mentioned ST12 uh, natively in one as being a possibility, perhaps even a probability now. Uh, people might want to put location data, they might want to put program data, uh, motion data, haptic data, you, you name it. There's all sorts of possibilities there that could be added in if people can get enough momentum and enough people together to say, let's standardize this and put it in as an addendum to the TLX standard. So it's, it's almost all work in progress, but as I say, I do believe we're making some good progress now. The structures I talked about, um, we, uh, as I said, we're gonna define each item in at least binary XML and JSON, and that's probably a complete list. Uh, we're talking about how best to identify, provide unique identifiers for uh, sources, because MAC address was an obvious idea, but it isn't really rigorous. Uh, if a device produces more than one stream, how do we identify which stream we're looking at? Um, and uh, we're looking at the definition of the individual items. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, in instance, for example, do we have situations might, where we might permit two timestamps within one label if they, a way to design, uh, to define what they mean uh, separately. Uh, this comes up a lot when we talk about uh, rendering things in non real time from servers. Uh, we might want a timestamp that said, hey, this is when it came out, this frame came out of the render server, uh, but it represents this particular timestamp on the timeline of the work. So there are certainly possible 
um, occasions where we might want multiple instances of an item within a label, very much under discussion. Uh, if there are things that are immutable, I mean, let's say the program name, we may not want to transmit those in every frame. That would be a tremendous waste of data space. Um, and so is there a way uh, to provide these once or on a lower repetition basis or on a separate uh, out of band system or whatever that uh, provides that mechanism and looking at possibilities there. And one thing we think will be relevant to a lot of a way a lot of people might use these is if we take a timestamp and a unique source identifier, we basically have a unique identifier for that frame, uh, which could be used as a key into a database where we could keep the rest of the information. So a lot of things under discussion here because people are coming at, at it. We've got you know, manufacturers, uh, time theorists, uh, users, uh, all sorts of people uh, in this work and uh, people are really sort of thrashing around to say, how can we make it as useful as possible? So that really concludes what I've got to say about this. Um, the main thing I want to conclude with though is if this interests you and you think you've got something to contribute, if you think there's something we haven't thought of, if you think we're doing it wrong, or if you think of additional applications we should ad address, um, please join us. Uh, this is, it's a relatively small group at the moment. Um, and we meet at the moment uh, every Thursday afternoon Pacific time uh, for an hour. Uh, there's a, a uh, email for uh, Bill Redman, who's the chair. And if you've got something to contribute, we'd love to have you join us. Oops. And then finally, uh, I do want to acknowledge Bill, who's uh, doing tremendous job as a chair and disciplining us all quite well and actually got us hopefully moving in the same direction at the moment. Uh, all the drafting group members, some have come and gone, some have stayed in forever and made tremendous contributions. And then uh, particularly as it includes a couple of local groups, uh, in the pre-COVID times when we were actually having physical meetings as well and hope they will be doing so again before too long, um, AJA and Sinclair Broadcast and Telestream have all provided financial assistance for me to go to meetings and I really appreciate that and on behalf of the group they appreciate it too. So thank you all very much. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I think you all have the ability to unmute. First of all, last Mona, do we have any questions on the chat? There are no questions in the chat, so I would suggest if people have a question to go ahead and unmute themselves and ask it. Do reclocking inputs negate the need for a timestamp? No. <laughs> um, the the timestamp is is useful in a number of ways. In uh, I mean, re reclocking deals with the synchronization issue. Uh, but it doesn't provide you any identification for individual uh, frames of video. You know, we may get, we hopefully get synced before the program starts, and at some arbitrary time after we, the reclocking uh, achieves synchronization, some arbitrary time after that, uh, the program's going to start. And the idea of time code and of uh, the TLX label is to say we want to provide a label for every frame of that video so we niche, we know which one it is, where it came from, where it fits in the overall program structure, uh, and to be able to go backward from the finished program uh, if we re maintain the original labels uh, and say, okay, this came out from this particular camera at this time and I can imagine in news, for example, this, this sort of forensic work being uh, quite valuable to say, oh, yes, the explosion happened at this time. And somewhere in that video, hopefully you have some way of verifying the, the timeline against some external reference. So we may be able to provide forensic information about exactly when things happened or how far apart they were and so on. Um, but, you know, the... The greatest use of these 
as of time code itself is actually a lot simpler uh, in that most editing systems, you know, take the incoming time codes, they record them, uh, and then they use an internally generated counter to actually do all the work, uh, but are able to refer it back to both the incoming time codes and the sort of stripe time code, if you like to use the old term uh, of the finished program, uh, so that those can all be related together and you see exactly where everything gone. So uh, in making things work, reclocking inputs are certainly a part of uh, you know, making the system work, but they don't provide any replacement for labeling the media units. Thank you. Anybody else? So where would this TLX time code be inserted? Are we proposing that it comes like straight from the camera recording or is this yeah. uh, put into the ancillary data into whatever recording device? Um, I, I would say potentially yes to all of these. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we actually step back from uh, defining a, a binary signal and saying this is TLX. Uh, I think a binary version of it uh, in conventional systems would probably end up in an ANTS packet. Um, in... Uh, 2110 systems, it would probably end up as part of the overall structure uh, that includes the uh, the media streams and the metadata. Uh, and people, some people object to my calling t uh, the time label metadata. Um, that's arguable. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but in, at least in the everything else that can go in a 2110 stream. Um, the moment it gets to a post house, uh, the first thing that a lot of post houses do with ST12 is they take all of their contributing uh, streams uh, and create a time code database of them uh, so that they've got in a database a, a, uh, you know, a reference for every frame of every component of the program they're working on. Um, I think TLX will make that easier. It will make it uh, a more useful database when you've built it. Uh, but uh, again, some of the very simple stuff, if you're just taking uh, a video into uh, an editing system, the editing system is probably going to stuff all the information in the TLX on one side and just create its own frame counter, uh, if you, unless you're into variable frame stuff. Uh, so TLX is, is necessarily overkill for a lot of applications, but if we can make it easy to use, reasonably compact overkill, then I think we've got a, still got a useful standard. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I guess the best thing, Bob, is to put you back as the host. I don't. I don't know that we need to do that. I can talk, Peter. So. Okay. Well. All right. I'll. 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 I'll leave me as the host, and <laughs> you tell me what's what to do. I did learn in the meantime that uh, you can assign co-hosts in Zoom, so we don't have to put the ball back and forth. So we'll get better at that oh, in the future. We'll get better at it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we're going to continue to do virtual meetings uh, through this simple year. So um, I look forward to our next uh, invitation and have a good night. Thanks to everyone. Bye now.